King William's War King William III ascended the English throne in 1689. After James II had been ousted in a Protestant revolt. William almost immediately, May 12, 1689, committed his nation to the Grand Alliance. Joining the League of Augsburg and the Netherlands to oppose French. King Louis XIV's invasion of the Rhenish Palatinate in Europe. This resulted in an eight-year conflict known as the War of the League of Augsburg. In America, the struggle was called King William's War and pitted the French and Abnaki Indians of Maine against the English and their allies among the Iroquois. The New World Theater of this war gave rise to a new kind of fighting. In 1689, Louis XIV dispatched Louis de Buade, Comte de Frontenac, to America as governor of New France. He had served in that capacity before, from 1672 to 1782, but was so dictatorial that he was recalled to France at the request of those he governed. Louis understood that. What his colonies needed just now was precisely what this tough 70-year-old had to offer. A stomach for relentless aggression. Frontenac proposed not merely a defensive strategy against the British, but an invasion of New York. His only problem, he soon realized, was that he did not have the manpower to invade anybody. The solution, Frontenac decided, was to fight a little war. One that consisted not of grand strategies and the mass. Movement of great armies fighting European-style battles. But of ambushes. Murders. And. Terror, mostly carried out by Indian allies. Properly coordinated. Such action would demoralize the English settlers while simultaneously draining their military resources. Frontenac's little war was a dreary pattern of raid and counter-raid. Without much decisive action. But with plenty of misery to go around from July 1689. When La Chine, Quebec, was ravaged by Iroquois to September 1691, when Benjamin Church, aged hero of King Philip's War, was called out of retirement to defend Sacco, Maine. By the end of the month, the English struck a truce with Abnakis, which, however, was soon violated. In September 1697, the Treaty of RYSWYCK ended the War of the League of Augsburg in Europe and, therefore, officially ended King William's War in America. But raids and counter-raids continued through the end of the 17th century. Queen Anna's War now it's time to return to the cheerful precincts of civilized Europe. England. Holland. And Austria had the jitters over an alliance struck between France and Spain when King. Charles II of Spain. A Habsburg, that is. Originally an Austrian. Died in 1700. Having. Named a Bourbon that is, originally a Frenchman, as his successor. The French, naturally, backed Charles' nominee, Philip of Anjou, the grandson of Louis XIV. England, Holland, and Austria threw their support behind the Bavarian Archduke Charles' 
second son of the Habsburg Emperor Leopold I. These three nations then formed a new grand alliance in 1701. And the War of the Spanish Succession was declared between the Grand Alliance and France and Spain on May 4, 1702. In America, the conflict was called Queen Anna's War. The war began on September 10, 1702, when the South Carolina legislature authorized an expedition to seize the Spanish-held fort and town of St. Augustine, Florida. When a combined force of 500 colonists and Chickasaw Indians failed to breach the fort, they settled for burning the town instead. Not unexpectedly, this act brought a series of counter-raids from Spanish-allied Apalachee Indians which prompted South Carolina Governor James Moore to lead a force of militiamen and Chickasaws in a destructive sweep of western Florida during July 1704. The result Seven villages and thirteen Spanish missions, out of fourteen in the area, were raised and the Apalachee were effectively annihilated as a tribe. Strategically, Moore's campaign opened a path into the heart of French Louisiana. Anticipating this, French colonial authorities heavily bribed the Choctaws into an alliance which blocked Moore's advance into Louisiana. In the meantime, up north, the French had managed to gather even more Indian allies, especially among the Abnakis, who ravaged English settlements in Maine, where Queen Anna's War was called the Abnaki War. Farther north, in Nova Scotia, Benjamin Church, now so enfeebled by old age that he had to be carried into battle, terrorized the French. Acadian settlements of Minas and Bobassin during July 1704. While in Newfoundland, French and Indian forces retaliated during August by destroying the English settlement at Bonavista. The war raged from St. Augustine, Florida, to St. John's, Newfoundland. Captured by the French just before Christmas 1708, not in a series of great battles, but in a string of murders, raids, and counter raids. In 1713, Louis XIV, weary of war and crushed under heavy debt, was ready to end the wars in Europe and America. The cause of the War of the Spanish Succession had become a moot point. The eleven-year-old Bavarian Archduke backed by the Grand Alliance had died. And Louis' grandson Philip of Anjou ascended the Spanish throne by default. The Treaty of Utrecht, July 13, 1713, ended the European and American Wars with Hudson Bay and Acadia becoming English and Isti, Lawrence Islands becoming French. The Abnakis swore allegiance to the English crown, but continued to raid the English settlements of Maine for years, Tuscarora and Yemisee Wars. At about the time Queen Anna's War was winding down, the Tuscarora Indians in North Carolina were growing tired of being cheated and abused by colonial traders, to whom they continually lost goods and land and at whose hands they even suffered abduction for sale into the West Indies slave trade. In 
wishing to avoid war. The Tuscaroras. In 1709, obtained permission from the government of Pennsylvania to migrate there. The government of North Carolina refused to furnish the required certificate to make the migration possible. After all, the North Carolina traders enjoyed making a profit from the Indians. In 1710, a Swiss entrepreneur named Baron Christoph von Grafenried founded the settlement of New Bern at the confluence of the Neuse and Trent rivers in North Carolina. Grafenried chose not to purchase his land from the Tuscaroras, but instead, secured the blessing of North Carolina Surveyor General to appropriate the property and drive the Indians off. That was the final straw for the Tuscaroras. On September 22, 1711, they attacked New Bern, killing 200 settlers, including 80 children. Remarkably, Grafenried, captured and released, managed to negotiate peace, only to have it broken by William Bryce, who, thirsting for revenge, captured a local chief of the Cori tribe, allies of the Tuscaroras, and roasted him alive. The war was renewed. And, as if Bryce's act had set its tone, was filled with more than the usual quota of atrocities, including the death by torture of scores of captive soldiers and settlers. North Carolina called on South Carolina for help. In 1713, South Carolina's Colonel James Moore combined 33 militiamen and one 000 Allied Indians with the troops of North Carolina to strike all the principal Tuscarora settlements. This force killed hundreds of Tuscaroras and captured some 400 more, whom the governor sold into slavery to defray the costs of the campaign. A peace treaty was signed in 1715, and those Tuscaroras who managed to Escape death or enslavement migrated north, eventually reaching New York. In 1722, they were formally admitted into the Iroquois League as its sixth nation. No sooner was the 1715 treaty concluded than the Yemesis, a South Carolina tribe, rose up against their white neighbors for much the same reasons that had motivated the Tuscaroras. Abuse, fraud, and enslavement. The military response, led by South Carolina, Governor Charles Craven, was swift and terrible. With the aid of Cherokee allies, the Yemesis were hunted to the point of tribal extinction. King George War. Men have seldom needed to look very hard for a reason to start a war. This one began with the loss of an ear. Following Queen Anna's War, or, if you prefer, the War of the Spanish Succession. England concluded the Asiento with France's ally, Spain. This was a contract permitting the English to trade with the Spanish colonies in goods and slaves. English traders soon abused the privileges granted by the Asiento. However, and Spanish officials responded harshly. In one case, Spanish coast guards seized Robert Jenkins, master of the British merchant ship Rebecca and cut off his ear during an interrogation. Word of this outrage triggered the War of Jenkins' ear in 1739 between England and Spain. In 
resulting in an abortive invasion of Spanish Florida by George's James Oglethorpe. In 1740. Complete Idiot's Guide 53 to American History. During this time, the War of Jenkins' Ear dissolved into a larger conflict. Known in Europe as the War of the Austrian Succession. The death of the Holy Roman Emperor. Charles VI in 1740 brought several challenges to the succession of daughter Maria. Theresa as monarch of the Habsburg, Austrian, lands. It looked as if the Habsburg territories were ripe for the plucking. And King Frederick the Great of Prussia moved first to claim his slice by invading Silesia, France, Spain, Bavaria, and Saxony joined Frederick's fold, while Britain came to the aid of Maria Theresa. Once again, the European conflict also appeared in an export version, King George War. It was fought mainly by New Englanders against the French of Nova Scotia and again resulted in a wilderness in flames. Territory changed hands, but only temporarily, for the 1748 Treaty of Aix la Chapelle, which ended the War of the Austrian Succession, also ended King George's War, restoring, as treaty language puts it, the status quo ante. Bellum. The way things were before the war. But treaty language can be misleading. And. The status was no longer quite quo. Enmities and alliances among the French. The Indians. And the English were now not only lines drawn on a map. But scars seared into the souls. Of all involved. Wait a few more years. There would be a new, far bigger, far more terrible war. Global War from 1749 to 1763. The Treaty of Aix la Chapelle, which ended King George's War on October 18, 1748 brought no more than fleeting peace to the American frontier. On March 27, 1749, King George II granted huge wilderness tracts to a group of entrepreneurs called the Ohio Company, stipulating that, within seven years, the company must plant a settlement of 100 families and build a fort for their protection. The grant and the stipulation. Accompanying it rekindled the hostility of the French and their Indian allies. Who feared an English invasion. Their fears were valid. Throughout 1749, an influx of British traders penetrated territories. That had been the exclusive trading province of the French. In response, on June 26, 1749, Roland Michel Galissonier, Marquis de la Galissonier, Governor of New France, dispatched Captain Pierre Joseph Sellerin de Blainville with 213 men to the Ohio country. By November 20th, 1749. Celerin had made a round trip of 3. 000 miles. Burying at intervals. Lead plates inscribed with Francis' claim to sovereignty over the territory. The lines of. Battle were drawn. The French and Indian War. La Galissonier was replaced as governor by Jacques Pierre de Jonquière. Marquis de la Jonquière. In August 1749, he decided it would take more than buried lead plates to control North America. 
and he began to build forts. He also attacked the Shawnees. The most powerful of the Ohio country tribes who traded with the English. In the meantime, an English trader named Christopher Gist negotiated a treaty, 1752, at Logstown, Pennsylvania, between Virginia and the Ohio Company, and the six Iroquois nations, plus the Delawares, Shawnees, and Wyandots. This treaty secured for Virginia and the Ohio Company deeds to the vast Ohio lands. However, French Allied Indians drove the English out of this wilderness country by 1752, and yet another governor of New France, Ange Duquesne de Menneville, Marquis Duquesne, quickly built a string of forts through the Ohio country that ultimately stretched from New Orleans to Montreal. Lord Halifax in England pushed the British cabinet toward a declaration of war, arguing that the French, by trading throughout the Ohio Valley, had invaded Virginia. In the heat of war fever, Governor Robert Dinwiddie of Virginia secured authority from the Crown to evict the French from territory under his jurisdiction. He commissioned 21-year-old Virginia militia Captain George Washington to carry an ultimatum to the French. Interlopers Get out or suffer attack. Washington set out from Williamsburg, Virginia's capital. On October 31, 1753, and delivered the ultimatum to the Commandant of Fort LaBeouf, Waterford, Pennsylvania, on December 12, 1753. Captain Lagarde, 30 years older than Washington, politely but firmly declined to leave. In response, Governor Dinwiddie ordered the construction of a fort at the strategically critical forks of Ohio, the junction of the Monongahela and Allegheny Rivers, the site of present-day Pittsburgh. In the meantime, up in Nova Scotia, British authorities demanded that the Acadians French-speaking Roman Catholic farmers and fishermen who freely intermarried with the Mi'kmaq and Abnaki Indians swear loyalty to the British crown. These people had the misfortune of living in the midst of the most important fishery in the world. Waters coveted by all the nations of Europe. While the British threatened the Acadians with expulsion from Nova Scotia, the French threatened to turn their Indian allies against any Acadians who took the loyalty oath. Tensions mounted. Back at the forks of the Ohio, the French, having patiently watched the construction of Dinwiddie's fort, attacked, badly outnumbered, Ensign Edward Ward, in command of the New outpost. Surrendered on April 17, 1754, and was allowed to march off with his men. The next day, the English stronghold was now christened Fort Duquesne and occupied by the French. Unaware of this takeover, and on the very day that the fort fell, Dinwiddie sent Washington, now promoted to lieutenant colonel with 150 men to reinforce it. N. Route. On May 28, Washington surprised a 33-man French reconnaissance party. In the ensuing combat, 10 of the Frenchmen were killed, including Ensign Joseph Coulon de Villiers de Jumonville, a French ambassador.
This battle, then, was the first real battle of the French and Indian War. Realizing that the French would retaliate, Washington desperately sought reinforcement from his Indian allies. A grand total of 40 warriors answered the call. It was too late to retreat. So at Great Meadows, Pennsylvania, Washington built a makeshift stockade and christened it Fort Necessity. On July 3rd, Major Coulon de Villiers, brother of the man, Washington's small detachment had killed, led 900 French soldiers, Delawares, Ottawas, Wyandots, Algonquins, Nipissings, Abnakis, and French allied Iroquois against Fort Necessity. When the outpost's defenders had been reduced by half. On the 4th of July, Washington surrendered. He and the other survivors were permitted to leave. Save four. Two hostages. Who were taken back to Fort Duquesne. With the loss of the Ohio fort and the defeat of Washington. It was the English rather than. The French who had been evicted from the Ohio country. A desperate Congress convened. At Albany from June 19 to July 10. 1754. And produced a plan for colonial unity. The plan. Managed to please no one. In the meantime. From Fort Duquesne. The French and there. Many Indian allies raided freely throughout Pennsylvania. Maryland. And Virginia. Finally. In December 1754. The English Crown authorized Massachusetts Governor William Shirley. To reactivate two colonial regiments. These two. 000 men were joined by two of the British Army's absolutely worst regiments. Commanded by one of its dullest officers. Major General Edward Braddock. The French. Responded by sending more troops as well. And British forces were expanded to 10. 000. Men. On April 14. 1755. Braddock convened a council of war and laid out a plan of attack. Brigadier General Robert Monckton would campaign against Nova Scotia. While Braddock. Himself would capture Forts Duquesne and Niagara. Governor Shirley would strengthen. And reinforce Fort Oswego and then proceed to Fort Niagara, in the unlikely event that. Braddock was detained at Fort Duquesne. Another colonial commander. William Johnson. Was slated to take Fort St. Frederick at Crown Point. Moncton and John Winslow, a colonial commander, achieved early success in Nova. Scotia. But General Braddock struggled to get his expedition underway to Fort Duquesne. Braddock managed to alienate would-be Indian allies. And even insulted the Delawares so. Profoundly that they went over to the French side. Braddock also alienated the. Provincials. Of whom he was so thoroughly contemptuous that the colonial governors. Resisted collecting war levies and generally refused to cooperate with the general. At long last. Braddock led two regiments of British regulars and a provincial detachment. Under George Washington, out of Fort Cumberland. Maryland. It was an unwieldy force. Of two. Five hundred men loaded down with heavy equipment. Along the way. French allied Indians. Sniped at the slow moving column. Washington advised Braddock to detach a flying. Column of one.
500 men to make the initial attack on Fort Duquesne. Which Braddock believed was defended by 800 French and Indians. By July 7, the flying column set up a camp 10 miles from their objective. Spies out of Fort Duquesne made Braddock's forces sound very impressive. And the forts. Commandant. Claude Pierre Picotti de Contracour. Was prepared to surrender. But. Captain Leonard de Beaujou convinced him to take the initiative and attack. All he had. Available were 72 regulars of the French Marine. 146 Canadian militiamen. And 637. Assorted Indians. These he threw against Braddock's encampment on the morning of July. 9. 1755. The result was panic among the British. Troops fired wildly, or at each other. It is said that many of the British regulars huddled in the road like flocks of sheep. Braddock, stupid but brave, had five horses shot from under him as he vainly tried to rally his troops. At last, mortally wounded, he continued to observe the disaster of one. 459. Officers and men who had engaged in the Battle of the Wilderness. Only 462 would return. George Washington, though unhurt, had two horses shot from under him and his coat, pierced by four bullets. As he lay dying, Braddock said simply, Who would have thought? It Panic. Retreat. Retrenchment. The defeat at the Battle of the Wilderness drove many more Indians into the camp of the French and laid English settlements along the length of the frontier open to attack. 2. Make matters worse. The French had captured Braddock's private papers, which contained his main war plan. French Governor Vaudrill had intended to move against Fort Oswego. On the south shore of Lake Ontario, learning from Braddock's abandoned papers that Forts Niagara and St. Frederick would be the objects of attack. He reinforced these positions. Using the very cannon the routed English had left behind. While the Pennsylvania Maryland and Virginia frontiers were convulsed by Indian raids. William Johnson was victorious at the Battle of Lake George and built the strategically important Fort William Henry on the south end of the lake. Washington returned from the Battle of the Wilderness, persuaded authorities to build more forts, extending from the Potomac and James and Roanoke rivers down into South Carolina. These forts, Washington said, were the only effective means of combating the widespread Indian raids unleashed by the French. By June 1756, British settlers in Virginia had withdrawn ISO miles from the pre-war frontier. George Washington complained to Governor Dinwiddie. The Blue Ridge is now our frontier.